Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, my name is Karina de Toy. I'm the program manager here at the African Doctoral Academy. You're all very welcome. So uh, I guess while we're just waiting for everybody to settle in, I'm going to ask that you tell us where, um, okay, can everybody else hear me? Is, am I, okay. Um, I'm logging in from a very chilly, but very sunny Cape Town. So maybe we can also just let everyone know where everybody else is, is, um, is logging in from. Christine, just maybe check if you haven't muted your, your laptop. Um, so I know I would also like to introduce before we get to our presenter, also our colleague Amalsha, who will be helping me to collect the questions and do the moderation. Amalsha is joining us from a very chilly Maseru. Is that right, Amalsha? Yes, exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Amalsha also is always our, our front-facing colleague. Um, so we've got Mobra and Cape Town. Pretoria, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so good. So formally, I would like to welcome everyone to our workshop today, Tips on Getting Published in Academic Journals with Prof. Leslie Swartz. Um, I would just like to extend a warm welcome to everyone, former ADA delegates and presenters, colleagues at Stellenbosch. It's always so nice to see some familiar names in the audience. As I said, I'm Karina de Toy. I'm the program manager at the ADA. Um, we will be recording this lecture and we will be posting it on our YouTube channel. And we will share this link on email along with Prof. Swartz's presentation after we finish to everybody that enrolls and you're welcome to to also pass on the recording so um one of my absolute favorite colleagues at Stellenbosch University is Prof Leslie Swartz I've, I've had the pleasure of hosting him at the ADA more than once and we traveled to Ethiopia together to to present a workshop for Stellenbosch and it was just so much fun so more information for you so Leslie is a professor at Stellenbosch University he focuses today on some tricks of the trade in academic publishing with focus on, on publishing in an accredited academic journals. He will provide an informal introduction to key issues in getting published. And the talk is aimed mainly at those who are new to academic publishing and the peer review process, although of course, all are welcome. Prof. Swartz is a practicing clinical psychologist in addition to an academic and lecturer at Stellenbosch University, and he focuses on disability studies. Um, I was going over his CV earlier and it was just pages and pages of scrolling when it comes to his academic and publication record. Leslie, you have more than 400 academic outputs to your name. I think something to be very proud of. Um, last year, after getting your PhD from UCT in psychology in 1990, you were awarded your second PhD from Stellenbosch and you also published a critically acclaimed book from that exercise on how I lost my mother. Amalsha, I put a, a screenshot of it on the second slide, um, if you can just scroll across to it, so people can also see what it looks like. There we go. Um, it's from Wits University Press, published this year. This is a memoir that received considerable claim. So if, if you find it interesting, please, please go and look for it. So Leslie, you have graduated 44 PhD candidates and you're currently supervising another 13. You are the editor-in-chief of the South African Journal of Science, our highest ranked local publication and you're an elected member of the Academy of Sciences for South Africa. In 2019, you received the highest honor, the gold medal for Science for Society, which was, I think, for all of us very exciting. So I'm delighted and excited to hand you over. And I'm also going to ask my first question for the day, uh, because I want to understand what habits you have that allow you to accomplish so much and where you find all the time to do all of this incredible work. And then just a last housekeeping note, um, we'll be doing Q&A at the end. Um, so please, please type your questions in the chat and I'll make sure it gets to Leslie. Over to you, Prof. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much. And thank you uh, for asking me to do this. Can, can you hear me okay? Good, okay. I'm not going to try, apart from admitting people in, try the sort of things that I'm very terrible at, which is, um, sharing my screen and then working out how to, uh, come on. Um, okay, can, can people see that? Is, can you see it says getting published in international, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, 
very much. It's always a, an enormous pleasure to work with Karina and Amalsha and everybody at the African Doctoral Academy. I, I wish we had had our second trip. We would have already had our third trip to Ethiopia. Um, but you know, here, here's her. I, I love working with you. I think you, you guys do do great work. This is a very informal uh, presentation. So. Um, why am I a good person to do this is, is uh, I think because as, as Karina has mentioned, I do, I have a lot of publications, uh, uh, over 400. I've also um, been a reviewer for many, many articles for journals and I've got a lot of experience as a journal editor. I'm not an expert on writing. I, um, I, so this is not, even, this is not very, Kind of technical in terms of in terms of how to write. This is this is really why I started doing these uh, talks. Is there were so many things that I wish I'd known when I started out as an academic uh, over thirty years ago, um, and I really bumped my head a number of times. So, so these are just this is really about sort of tricks of the trade. Um, it's quite difficult, you know, not to not to be in person, not to be able to see everybody. Please do put questions in the chat, and when they are being uh, watched for me, and we will have a Q and A at the end. I've said to Karina, she, um, it's her job to interrupt me or to stop me, um, and we will uh, see, see how we go. But uh, thank you, thank you very much, um, everybody for for being there. I personally won't be able to look at the chat while I'm, I'm doing this. I'm not so good at multitasking, but um, Karina will, 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 will uh, keep that going. Um, just before we start, I want you to think about something. Um, those of you who, who um, are on this, I'm assuming that all of you have read articles in, in academic journals. I just want you to think about the last academic article you read. I'm not gonna make anybody answer questions. Don't, don't, don't get anxious about it. Just think about it and just try, try and think, be as honest as possible with yourself. Why did you read that? What was your purpose in reading that article? And we'll, we'll um, I hope, come back to that during the, the presentation. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to start um, really with, with where I think most of us are worried, which is with the issue of peer review. For those of you who are, who are not familiar with the peer review process, just to tell you very briefly, with um, any creditable um, academic journal, you send your article to the to the journal. If I'm the editor, like for example, the South African Journal of Science, which I'm editor of, I, I look at it, I see if it's suitable for the journal. If I believe that it may be, I um, send it out for reviewers to peers, generally speaking anonymously, and they make a decision um, on whether the article should be published or not. This will be familiar to, to many of you. The most common response, this is important to always bear in mind, the most common response from any journal is rejection, that we don't want to see your article again. Um, many journals, including my own, have a rejection rate of over 90%. So out of every 90, 100 articles that get sent to us, over 90 of them will not be accepted. The very least common response is accept immediately. It's never happened to me. It's happened once to one of my PhD students and I threatened never to talk to her again. I was so jealous. Um, and, uh, and then there's the in-between and we will come back to this as, as we go on. The in-between where you get um, a response which says, make some changes and we'll think about it again. And you can go through various processes of revision that can be you can be asked to revise once, twice, three times, four times, five times um, before the journal makes a decision whether they're going to accept or reject your article. Being asked to revise something is no guarantee that, um, that it's going to be accepted eventually. So, so, that's, so the, the first thing that, that academic authors have to think about and often that worries them, and we're going to start with this and then we're going to return to it later in the talk, is this issue of peer reviewers. 
And I'm going to use um, everything that I that I use in this presentation are, are, are actual examples. So if I can get myself onto the the next uh, slide. So here are here's examples of some things that reviewers have said on articles submitted for, for publication. These are the kind of things, unfortunately, that reviewers sometimes say. This article adds nothing to knowledge. I can't see why the author bothered. Or a particular favorite of mine, because I am an, an, an African and I write from Africa. Um, something that my uh, colleagues and I get very often. The author is clearly not English speaking and needs some remedial help in English before he or she should think of publishing in academic journals. So these, these, are, these are some actual examples. And I want you to think for a minute. Many of you will have had this experience already. What does it feel like to get feedback like this? And it, it, um, it doesn't feel nice. Nobody's delighted to get feedback like this. And under these circumstances, what you will often want to do as a, as a writer, um, and what we generally do uh, as, as people under situations of, of threat, there are three responses to these sorts of things fight so you want to you know find that person hunt them down but you can't and and do something terrible to them flight run away and many people do this i've had people tell me oh you know jur this journal didn't like me so i never wrote again um, journals do not have preferences for people and we'll come on in onto this later so it's fight flight or freeze just think i you know I, I don't know what what to do and it's understandable nobody likes to hear these sorts of things i can now reveal to you that all three of these were feedback that i got as a right as an author myself i promise you i've had more rejection letters than you've had hot breakfasts so if i've got 400 academic things published I, i've got many many more rejections um if you work out the 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 chances and what, what do you have to do? You have to, and the first thing that you have to understand is that this is part of how academic publishing works. You are sending your stuff to, um, to people. The chances of your being rejected are much stronger than your chances of being accepted. Part of what you have to do is develop a thick skin, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, start all over again. So in the case of all of these, what did I do? I didn't change a single word. I simply sent the same article to other journals. Eventually, all these articles got published. And I want to draw your particular attention because most peer review is anonymous. But I want to draw your particular attention to the third comment here, because when you're writing from Africa, and the reason I put, if, 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 if you saw, um, I put international in inverted commas, um, for many of us, decisions about our careers are made by whether we can publish in journals which are published from the global north, in North America, Europe, Australia, generally. Um, you know, so there are other journals that are international, but which aren't seen uh, as counting as much. And we can have a whole, we could have a whole seminar on the problems with that, but we're not, we're not talking about the problems with the game. I'm now working within the rules of the game. But there is often, even if you send things in, which are anonymized and so on. The minute you're writing from Africa, people often make assumptions. So I am English speaking. I spend a lot of time teaching people how to write. It's a lot of how I spend my time. I edit a lot in English. This is, this is my life I, and I have a PhD in English. And yet I get responses like the author is clearly not English speaking. Blah. And I am, so I felt, I felt very hurt by this. Um, and I don't need remedial help in English, but this was said to me because partly I think because of prejudice against um, African authors. Um, and part of what I believe very, very strongly about Africans publishing is that we, the only way we are going to deal with the imbalance in knowledge between rich and poor countries is if we step up to the plate and we publish and we're assertive and we put our ideas out there. We've got to stop complaining about people ignoring African ideas if we're not publishing ourselves in places where other people are going to see our work. So um, the first lesson is develop a thick skin. Okay. Um, and let's, let's uh, carry on. Something you will have heard um, uh, 
many times is that in order to publish in, in academic journals, you have to be original. You have to be saying something new. To some extent, that's true. And to some extent, that's, that's not true. And I, I like a, a song. Stephen Sondheim writes uh, Broadway musicals like Into the, Into the Woods and, and, and various other ones. And he has a song actually talking about trying to sell his, um, his musicals to, to investors. And he, he, he mentions in the song, they always say that they want original things. But actually, if people are going to buy something, what he says is all they ever want is repetition. All they really like is what they know. To some extent, people who read academic journals want that as well. If you think about the question that I asked you at the beginning, why did you read the, the last article? There are a number of things you probably haven't said. You probably have not said, I, I read the last academic article I read in order to find out how clever the author is. I don't imagine many of you thought that we could have done a little poll if I were better on, on um, all of these uh, interactive techniques, but I'm, but I'm not, but I bet you didn't say that. In fact, many of you, if I were to say to you, tell me who the author was and tell me what university they work at, you probably wouldn't know. So it's not about the individual. I bet you none of you said, you know, I read the last academic article in order to find out that everything that I've done in my academic career so far, so I'm working on my PhD or I'm working on my book, I'm, to find out that it's all nonsense and there's this completely original thing, which means that I have to start all over again. Nobody wants that. What the reason I imagine that you said is that, that why do we read as academics? We read in order to support our own production. I'm reading because I'm doing a thesis. I'm reading because I'm writing an article and um, I need to reference things. Generally speaking, the function of the, the way in which we consume academic writing is in order to help our own teaching or research or so on. And that, that really has very important implications for the way in which we set ourselves up as, as academic authors. Um, Peter Collett, uh, used to be the uh, ex-South African, used to be the, the editor of a very good journal called Journal for the Theory of Social Behavior. And he used to make a joke about academic articles. And he used to say a good academic article has one idea and preferably fewer. Now, he didn't mean that the, the joke was, of course, we, we want academic articles to have an idea. He didn't think it was an idea, a good idea to have an, an academic article with no ideas. But the point about one idea is really really central, especially if you're an inexperienced author. If you're an experienced author and you don't feel confident, um, what you are often tempted to do is to try, and you think, oh, they're going to think I'm not clever enough, which we've spoken about already. Part of what you might be tempted to do is to try to convince your readership how much you know. So you put every idea that you've ever had into, into this paper. That's not, that's that's not gonna get you anywhere. A journal article should be about one thing and it should be very clear. So you should, regardless of your field, if somebody says to you, what is your article about um, that, that you're writing at the moment? Or what is your PhD about? What is your master's about? You should be able to tell them in one sentence, it's about this. So what we're often doing when we're writing academically is not putting down every idea that we've ever thought about, but being very, very clear. And I'm going to show you how to do this, being very clear about what our one idea is. And this goes across all disciplines. So I imagine that there are people here from a wide range of disciplines. What is the one thing that you are, are saying? And this comes to the, the last point. When I was at school, I had to read this book by Vance Packard. It was in the late 60s early 1970s, which was, I'm sure, before many of you were born. But it, uh, this book was called The Hidden Persuaders, and it was about advertising. And if any of you have, have um, ever read any beauty magazines or looked at advertisements, look at advertisements on, on television or on billboards. And when I talk about beauty magazines, I'm not referring only to, to uh, magazines for women. In South Africa, there's a, a very good beauty magazine called Men's Health, which is all about how men can make themselves look more beautiful and have bigger muscles and, and so on. And look at how they sell their products. They do not sell their products by saying, you are very, very, very ugly. 
But if you use our lipstick, maybe you'll be a bit less ugly. That doesn't make buyers. Um, and in fact, many of you I would imagine have been affected by, and you may have researched um, AIDS, the, the AIDS epidemic in, in, uh, in Africa. And you may remember the early AIDS messaging, which was a total failure. And what was it? It was, you're gonna die. It was the essential messaging was you're going to die, but um, if you take certain precautions, maybe you won't. And I mean, people just won't listen to that sort of thing. Nobody likes to be set up as bad, dangerous, about to die, and so on. So when you're writing an article, you have to be, as Vance Packard said in, in, in advertising. So he gives, he gives examples of um, selling cosmetics when people already have enough cosmetics um, or uh, you know, selling shoes or whatever it is. And he says that part of the way this is done and have a look at this when you, when you look next to television or magazines or whatever, they will often, they will set up the consumer as an expert and then they will add extra. So for example, I'm now going to give an example, as you see, it works very well for me, for hair products. And it'll, it might say, an advert for hair products will say, you, you always knew that honey and lemon is very good for your hair, but you didn't know that with our extra ingredient of lanolin and beeswax, your hair is going to be even more beautiful and curly than, than before. As you can see, it didn't really work for me, but you get the idea is you always knew, you, so you've always been beautiful, you've always known how to make your hair beautiful. I'm gonna help you with making it even more beautiful. Now, that may seem, seem like a, a lot of nonsense. What does this have to do with academic publishing? But it has absolutely to do with the way in which you engage with your, with your, um, with your audience. And we're gonna talk a lot about audience in, in a minute. You set up your article in such a way that you communicate to readers of that particular journal, not people in general, the readers of that particular journal, what they already know, so what you expect readers of that journal to know, and how you are adding to the debate. So you're not saying, look at me, I'm so original, you've never thought of this. What you're saying is, you always knew something, I can add this little bit something to you. You're not setting yourself up in opposition to your readership, you're in a conversation with your readership, and we're gonna talk more about that later. So the issue then becomes one of, um, taking your reader with you. I wanna give you an example from my own experience. I do a lot of interdisciplinary work. I'm a psychologist by training. Um, and some of the work that I've done is on HIV vaccine research. Um, and that means that I work with microbiologists and medical doctors and, and so on. And I know nothing about microbiology. There may be people on this call who do, but I don't. And I was at a, a, a meeting and I was listening to these presentations on microbiology and I was sitting next to a microbiologist friend of mine. And those of you who are microbiologists will know what poles and gags are. I, had, I don't know what they are, but microbiologists talk about them. And I listened to these three presentations and I turned to my friend and I said to her, you know, that first group of scientists were quite good. The second group knew absolutely nothing about science. Uh, and the third group, they're really the top people. These are the people who are most likely, unfortunately, nobody succeeded yet to get us to, to developing uh, an AIDS vaccine. And my friend turned to me and she said to me, Leslie, you are so brilliant. How did you understand all this microbiology? I hadn't understood a word. What I was listening to was the tune. I was listening to the music. What do I mean by that? Uh, all I was looking at was the structure of their argument. And this is something people do not think about enough for academic writing. And I say this as, a, as an editor, I was looking to the shape of their argument, okay? And I could tell simply by how they'd shaped their argument, who knew, who knew the science better. I didn't understand any of the content. And essentially the shape that we're looking for is the double funnel. So what do you want? You start, and this goes for, in fact, for PhDs and, that, we, we, and, and masters, but we're talking about articles here. Where do you start? You start at the top of the of the, the double funnel at the big the, 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 the big space at the top. You start where you think the readership of that particular journal is. So if you're publishing in the International Journal of uh, Behavioral Economics, 
what are the big issues in behavioral economics now? You, um, you, st you start there and you narrow down your literature review until you get to the thin part of the, of the, um, of the double funnel, which is where you ask your, your, your particular question. You say how you answered your particular question, what method you used, what you found, and then once you've discovered what you found, then the question is, what, what does it mean? And I'll, I'll show you another version of this in a minute. Um, you, you then help your reader understand what the implications of this are, not for you, but for them. And I'll show you how, how to do this. Now, as, as a psychologist, I always think that um, attention deficit disorder is a wonderful um, metaphor for most academics. You know, and I know that there have, have been more things written <coughs> than you or I are ever going to be able to read, excuse me, in your academic fields. Um, so, and some of you will know attention deficit disorder um, briefly is something that occurs in children. Some of you may have had this disorder yourself. Um, it can occur, it can continue into adulthood. And it's the essential feature of it that I want to talk about is problems with, with attention. And let's imagine an, uh, that you are going to a lovely park with a child who has attention deficit disorder. And in this park, there's a pond and there are ducks to look at, and there are swings to go on, and there's a roundabout, and there's, there are all these interesting things for, for children to play on. If you take a child with attention deficit disorder to, to such a place, and you let them run around free, what's gonna happen is they'll run from one thing to another, it'll all end in tears. You may have had this, these experience for those of you who've been this child or, 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 or had these children. So what does a good adult do? You take the child by the hand and you say, okay, we're going to the park. What do you want to look at first today? Um, and the child may say, I want to go and see the ducks. And as you're going to the ducks, the child's attention is suddenly, oh, but what about this? And what you'll do is you'll say, first, we, we might get a chance to go to the slide later, but we are going to the ducks now. So what you're doing essentially is you are narrowing and scaffolding the attention of this child so that they can have a meaningful day. When any academic, think about yourself, there is so much to read. You open a journal and you look, one of your first questions is, is this, is this article for me? Should I be reading this? Is, is there something not better that I should be reading? Am I wasting my time? I've only got limited time. I mean, you all understand this. So in fact, all good academics have a form of attention deficit disorder. So one of the big questions your readers are going to have is, is this the right article for me? What is it and what is it not? So in the literature review part, the setup of your, of your um, article, what's important is keep narrowing and indicating to your reader, not a, a literature review is not this, but this article said this, that person said that, that one said that, that one said that. That's not a literature review. That's just, I call it vomit. Sorry, I mean, it's, it's sort of taking something in. What it is, is a structured guide for your reader, taking them from where they are as the reader of the journal to your particular question. By the time you have, you get to your particular method and so on, your reader should be able to anticipate what your, your precise research question is. So you take them through the literature saying, we're not going there. Um, you know, so if you, if you think about HIV, for example, um, and you're talking about HIV and behavior, you can indicate quite clearly early on, well, I'm not going to be talking about the, the brain effects of HIV because HIV can, can uh, cause changes in the brain. We're not going there. But, you know, but here is where we are going and we're narrowing, narrowing, narrowing. Let me give, I, I'm gonna give you an example of this. This is a real example from a colleague of mine and a colleague of mine, um, this is a long time ago, if I can, why is it not? Um, sorry, oh, there we go. Um, a colleague of mine was writing her PhD on, on aspects of aging. And she asked me to read it for her. And I looked at chapter one and chapter one was like 20,000 words on the biology of aging. Um, 
and chapter two was 20,000 words on the psychology of aging. Chapter three was 20,000 words on the sociology of aging, all actually quite good summaries of the literature. And then can any of you just think to yourself now, and I'm afraid it's hard to do this interactively, can you guess what her research question was? And the answer for you is going to be no. Of course you can't guess. Because what you've been given are these slabs of information. There's no structure here. What my colleague was not doing was making the funnel. She was not drawing the attention of the reader more and more through the literature to her specific question and methods. Her question was actually a very interesting one. It was about recently in Cape Town, they had opened up a unit for people with Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's very important uh, issue, particularly in Africa at the moment. And she was interested in why people ended up in this facility versus that facility. Um, and in fact, I think if you if you think about it, in her question, which is essentially in some ways a question about health services, it's a kind of a sociological question, um, she needed to, to indeed look at the, the, the biology. She needed to introduce what happens to the, to the aging brain and what happens in Alzheimer's, the psychology, what are the, the reactions to this, what happens to memory. She needed to think about the sociology of care, who cares for people, is it men, is it women, is it inside the houses? But she needed to structure all of those. And that was completely missing. So she had to redo the introduction using the same literature, but now making a story. And it's not a mistake. You are the author of your article. You have to take authority over the story that you write. Those words are related. Authorship and authority. You have to be the authority. So generally speaking, and I know we're dealing with a very multidisciplinary audience here, what is an article? Look like what is this? What is the shape of an article? Now we can get into fights, and I know I've, I've had this in, in in many of the workshops that I've run face to face in a, in a number of African countries. You can have a fight about you know what is the difference between a rationale and a justification. I mean I don't understand any of those terms, and um, maybe it's, it's a bad thing that I don't understand them, but. You know, I have over 400 publications, so I'm doing something right. I may not be as clever as all the people who understand those terms, but you know, I've still managed to publish in, in good journals. And really, what do, what do you what does your reader want to know? Well, what your reader wants to know is very simple. It's in the yellow on the left. Why did you do your study? Why did you do it? That's actually all of the the where you started, how you did it, what procedures you went through to do it, what you found. And what it means. That's all they're interested in. Um, now they're fancy words that depending on your discipline, and I've I've learned because I work in, you know, that people use different words. Some people would call why I did it a rationale, and we'll call how I did it a method, and what I did a procedure, what I found a re results and discussion. But I mean in some journals they'll call it findings and some they'll say it's I'm I'm not interested in the fancy words. What I'm interested is that for anybody who's wanting to write. What's important is for you to be as clear as possible and as simple as possible about your, your ideas. So if you can think, this is what I have to communicate. Why did I do, and there, there, there are essentially two, two reasons that, that, that we do research in, in any discipline. We've noticed something in the world that doesn't make sense to us, and or we've noticed something in that people are saying about the world to other researchers, and there, and there is a kind of a gap. And for many of us in Africa, Part of the gap is that we don't have African data. So you, know, you look at all these journals called the International Journal of this and that, and it's actually not international. It's in North America and Europe um, and, 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 and so on. And on that topic, we have to think about there's a lot of pressure on me, and I would imagine you, to publish in, the, in, in, uh, in uh, journals which are either published in the Global North, North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, or um, have some kind of credibility with the Global North rankings and so on. So like South African Journal of Science, which I happen to be editor of. So then the question becomes, who's my audience? And many people will say to me, you know, I'll say, why are you writing this academic article? And they'll say, I'm writing it for government. Well, I've got news for you. Most government officials neither have the time nor the training to read academic articles. And if we had the time, and I'll be doing a course 
for, for, the, for the ADA later this month. We'll talk about different forms of outputs. If you want to write for government, you're not writing academic articles, you're doing fact sheets and different kinds of things. So the question is, who is my, who is my audience and how do I know? Well, I mean, you know, the, 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 short, um, the short answer is, we don't really know who we, who we are talking to, but part of what we want to do is to be able to, to enter into a conversation with our, our um, readership. And, and I've, I've said, you know, you've got to take the reader by your hand, just like taking the child through that park where there were ducks and things, well, then you have to know who they are. So how do we know? Well, we don't know, but in fact, the only people that you have to convince that this is worth reading Generally speaking, it's very few people. It's it's two or three reviewers, and often the editor um, uh, uh, of the journal. So let's focus on them. A very important part of any kind of strategy around publishing is is early on, as you're thinking about publishing, start thinking about your audience, and often before you've even started writing an article. So often, I, I, when I do one-on-one. Um, -on -one, uh, training and publishing, we'll often spend the first hour not writing a word, but looking at different journals, always look at the instructions for authors. What do they want? And then very, very important, look at what has as recently as possible been accepted in that journal. Because if you want to know what has success in, a, in, in getting into that journal in 2021, see what's just been published in 2021. There's something in that which has convinced the editor and the reviewers to accept that. And think about, okay, now I know um, if I'm writing about children, do not, do, do, do not send it to a journal on the Journal of Adult Development. Uh, if I'm writing about adults, do not send it to children development and, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so you've, you've looked at the aims and scope of the journal very carefully. You've looked at what's recently been published, and here's a here's a, a tip for you. As far as possible, if you think about how how do we enter into conversations with anybody, we start where they are, we add a little bit, they talk back, and so on. And your article is part of that conversation. The absolute ideal is if you can, if it's at all possible, find something recent published in that journal as recently as possible, which you can actually cite. And you can say, so, you know, these people have recently said this and this and this, that's, you remember, you always knew from the advertising. Um, uh, and, and that's very, very helpful. But I'm going to add this and this to the conversation. So you're indicating very clearly to your readership that you're now part of this conversation. And when it works, it really works. So um, I was working with a graduate student of mine and we were interested in um, HIV issues in men who have sex with men, which is a, a, a huge issue uh, globally. And we were interested in some spatial issues and we opened the journal and there had recently been an article as it happened on this very issue as it happened in Cape Town where we were doing our research and they were focusing on access to primary health care and our article was about safe spaces in which people can can become participants in um, HIV related research. So how did we start off? We said, you know, it's well known that, that men who have sex with men often have difficulty accessing healthcare in Africa. Um, recently, it was shown in Cape Town that uh, these authors showed that um, there are these problems accessing healthcare, but this is also an issue um, around research participation and that's how we're taking the the field forward. So that, and you and you know you know what I mean. I'm a journal. I'm a journal uh, editor. When I decide who's going to review this, when when I get the, the the publication in from you, your manuscript, who am I going to choose as a reviewer? It's probably people who are fresh in my mind, and those are likely to be people you don't know that, but it's likely to be people who've published recently in my journal because I know about them. So it may even end up that you actually in a conversation with the person who wrote that article. In this particular case, I, I can't tell you the whole story, but it turned out that that's exactly what happened. The authors of that article 
reviewed our article, loved it, and in fact, my PhD student now um, works for those people. <laughs> um, ended up getting a job with them. Okay, so we're now in conversation, and now you know people often um, say, particularly people from Africa, say, um, "Yes, but I mean, who's interested in me?" And I mean, there's this kind of colonial thing. I'm not good enough, and why would they be interested in me, and so on, and 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 so forth, and a, and a kind of underselling of, of ourselves. And and what I often ask people is, do, I mean, do you believe that people in North America are by definition, you know, more clever than people in Africa? I I don't, and I think it's actually you know quite a colonial and racist view. So let's let's think about um, this problem of inappropriate modesty. Do not undersell what you have to, 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 to offer. In my view, go for the best, the most appropriate journal for your work and work your way down. Yes, you're gonna be rejected, but it's, you're gonna be rejected anyway by a range of journals. Don't be too modest. One of the first articles I ever published uh, many years ago, it was published in 1985. Um, it was on work I was doing in Cape Town and uh, I, a professor said, are you going to send your work for publication? And I said to her, yes, I'm sending it to this top journal in my field. And she said to me, I'll never forget, she said to me, who do you think you are? You just little Leslie sitting here in Cape Town. Do you honestly think that the editor was Arthur Kleinman at, at, at Harvard is interested in your work? Send it to the South African Medical Journal. I'm so glad I didn't listen to her. Firstly, because politically, and for a whole range of other reasons, South African Medical Journal wouldn't have accepted it. I sent it to the top journal. They accepted it. And, and from there, in fact, I, I became there are a whole series of events because then I was asked to write other things. It's how I became a journal editor, and it's actually why I'm standing here talking you to, to you today through Zoom. It was only because I was cheeky. So do not undersell yourself. Do not buy into the view that by definition, you are not as good as other people. And, do, and never assume that reviewers who are less qualified are going to be kinder to you than reviewers who are more qualified. Because in, in fact, in my experience as a teacher, that's not true. I don't, um, it's often the people who are most harsh on students are, are not the strongest academics. So don't be a big smart aleck and try and tell everyone, you know, um, you know, I've invented a new, you know, theory of gravity or whatever it is. That's just, you know, nobody's going to listen to that. But, um, uh, but do not be shy to send your material where you think it should be sent. The other thing about these big journals is that they are often very good at rejecting very quickly. I want to apologize if there are journalists on this, on this call, but I, I always use this um, example. Uh, and I'm using a stereotype, but, but people say about journalism, a journalist is somebody who likes to make a mountain over a mole. Out of, out of a molehill. So they'll, they'll say, hear yeah, one person grumbling about uh, service delivery in a particular area in South Africa, and they'll publish um, widespread service delivery protests in that area when in fact, and in fact, and this is very, very important, what impresses an academic audience is not the hugeness of your claims, but in fact, a different kind of modesty, the extent to which you can see that academic quality is determined not in fact by the size of your results, but by the strength of your methods. And I'm gonna tell you a joke actually that, that will show this. So in fact, what our job as academics is the opposite of journalism. Instead of making a mountain out of a molehill, we have to make molehills uh, out of mountains. And let me get out, when I was uh, in, the, in the early 1970s, I, I, one of the subjects I studied at university was maths. And my maths lecturer told this joke about a mathematician, an applied mathematician, and a physicist who went on a, um, a walking holiday to Scotland. And um, th they saw silhouetted against the sky a, a, a black sheep. They saw this black wool on the sheep. And so the physicist said, oh, so the sheep in Scotland are black. And the 
I'm, I'm updating the language a bit. And the applied mathematician said, no, you don't have evidence for that. All you know is some of the sheep in, in Scotland are black. And the mathematician said, no, you don't have evidence for that. All we know seeing this sheep side on is that in Scotland, there's at least one sheep, at least one side of which is black. Now that's a joke, uh, um, uh, and I hope some of you are laughing, but the point of this is, is that you have to be critical yourself of what you have found and not found. So one of, the, one of my pet hates as a reviewer and, and an author is when somebody's written this article and says, oh, I found out these wonderful things and those wonderful things. And then they say at the end, limitations, but my sample size was too small, my instruments didn't work properly and so on. That's too late. You need to be able to say, okay, these were the limitations. Given those limitations, what have I found in my research? So it's not about modesty, but it's about being very precise about what you have or haven't found. Many of you would have been taught that there are special ways of becoming academic writers, that you must, you must write in, in all kinds of fancy ways. Um, there's no such thing in my view as academic writing. There's only good writing and bad writing. Um, let me give you an example. Um, let me give you some, some, some actual examples. These have all been published, but um, they, um, they're all problematic. Uh, uh, you, can, you can look at all of them. I, I want to go um, very quickly to the third one, um, which is, it is believed. Um, many of you, I think, have been taught that you must, you must write in the third person and the passive voice. Um, that's, that's not a good way to write. And, and you will often see writing in what is called, this is, it is believed, is what's called an agentless passive. And what that means is that you don't know who believes it. So lots of people believe lots of things. So you, you could write down and say, it is believed that the earth is flat. It is believed that the royal family are, um, are lizards. Uh, you know, it is believed that there are no rivers in Africa, all there are are conveyor belts with water, which, I mean, all those things are believed. So, so you, must be very, you know, don't use imprecise things like that. Who believes things? Um, and write as simply as you possibly can. You then get things like this. 50% of the four subjects were approached by the investigator and were requested for their participation under the auspices of the current study. Well, how about writing? We approached two of the four subjects. We, uh, we approached uh, two of the four, four uh, people and asked them to participate. Much clearer. Research has shown I won't go into now. I haven't got time, but it, it, it sort of worries me. And then you get these things, and then you think, oh my goodness, I have to write like this. You don't, because a lot of academic writing is really terrible. But you get things like notwithstanding the heretofore mentioned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what that means. Um, and you know, if I had time, I could talk a lot about how the publishing industry is set up actually in some ways to exclude people who are not first language uh, English because people look at this and think, oh, that sounds very clever. It's actually not clever, it's nonsense. So, so how, how should you be thinking about writing? Um, the essential point about academic writing, like all writing is simplicity, as simple as possible. Keep your sentences short, use the active voice. Sometimes you're gonna need big words, but if you don't need big words, use small words. Um, use, use words of one syllable. When you finished with your argument, stop. Remember, you're not gonna say everything you know. Every journal editor will give you an, an, uh, an upper limit of how long an article should be and would be delighted because there's such pressure on space if your article is, sh is shorter. If the journal allows it, you can use the first person. I like that, where you actually use the words I and so on. Use signposts. So remember, we're taking the reader by the hand. So use subheadings. Show where you're going. Say, I'm going to be talking about the following three things. And then you, talk, you don't talk about four things. You talk about three things. Simplify. Do not succumb to the pressure to make things look fancier than they are. 
and you don't have to say everything we've spoken about this before, it's not your life's work. If you look at the, the quotation on the right, the blow catches him from the right, sharp and surprising and painful, like a bolt of electricity lifting him up off the bicycle. This is the first line of a novel. It's very simple. It's got a couple of big words, but you can't avoid them, electricity and bicycle. But it's really simple. And when I read that word, like millions of other readers, I want to know what happened next. What, what's this person talking about? Well, this is very simple writing. It's also writing by a Nobel Prize winner, J.M. Quetzia. It's a novel of his called Slow Man, which is about uh, disability. Um, so, um, if we summarize, and I think it was, I think it was Karina who actually sent me this, this um, cartoon. Uh, but generally speaking, what do we want? We want people to be writing about complicated things, but the average sentence is, is easy to understand, which is great writing. Or, where the subject matter is simple, we want um, uh, this, to be easy to understand. That's honest writing. Unfortunately, when the average sentence is hard to understand and the subject matter, matter is complex, that's where most academics are writing. We don't want that. And unfortunately, and particularly in the social sciences, sciences and I'm a social scientist, where the average sentence is hard to understand and the subject matter is simple, it's probably just, excuse me for, for saying bullshit. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, um, that's... that's uh, uh, really important just, just to remember. Many of you are going to be really challenged in terms of finding time to write. And I wish like this guy, Nick Dawes, I could teach you how to write any book in 28 days, I can't. But the only way to learn how to write is, is to write. You've got to make time to write. So you attend a million workshops and hear a million people like me telling you what to do, but the only way to learn how to write is to, is, is to write. How do you do this? One of the ways is to get up 15 minutes earlier every morning, uh, five days a week. I promise you this works. And just write anything. Just write for 15 minutes um, every day. And just keep it. It doesn't matter if it's nonsense. It doesn't matter if you end up writing your shopping list. Get into the habit. It's like riding a bicycle. How do you learn to ride a bicycle? By getting on the bicycle. You fall off. But attending a workshop will not teach you how to write to how to how to ride a bicycle we are all experts at not writing it's lovely if 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 your institutions can take you all away to lovely places where you have writing retreats and groups but you can also organize yourself into what are called shut up and write groups where even that can even be done virtually where you you block off time in your diary and you you're writing at the same time as other people, and then you have breaks when you can gossip, you can drink coffee, you can do what, 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 um, whatever you like. You've got rule number one: you've 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 got to make time to write, and and you've got to learn to be able to write in those tiny bits of shared time. You can't say I can only write if I have three days or a month or whatever, because most academics don't don't have that kind of time. The, the most important thing is just to get started writing. So write every single day if you can. As Silvio, who wrote a very good book on how to write a lot, he's a very um, well-published academic. The secret is, is um, regularity. Lizette Raba, who some of you will know is professor of journalism at Stellenbosch University, talks about the ABC approach, which is the art of attaching your bottom to the chair. You're not going to write unless you write. And now comes a really important thing. When you are starting to write, do not edit. So do not change what you write. Get into the habit of just writing and not worrying. You'll look about writing and editing are not the same. So Augusto Boal, who is a, a theater of the oppressed uh, person talked about the cop in the head. Don't let the cop in the head tell you how terrible your writing is because then you'll sit there and I know because I've done this so many times before, people will know about this, where you've sat for three, four, five days trying to write the first sentence and not being able to do it. That's, you know, I've, I've got a way around that, but that is the cop in the head. It's trying to make something perfect and actually, the most important thing in the beginning is just get words on the page. You can change your mind later, just get the words on the page. Um, keep all of your versions. So the version that you think is terrible today, you may think is brilliant in a year's time. Keep them, date them, 
put them away. Don't delete things. Just keep keep uh, different versions. Um, a really important thing that that um, I learned relatively late: you don't have to start where it's difficult to write. The hardest sentence of any article is the first sentence. So don't start writing with it. Start where it's easiest. For me, when I collect data, the easiest place for me to start writing is to write what I did, my, my method, because I know what I did. And then I, do with, and then I do my results. And then actually I write my introduction because then remember, I've got to take my reader to, to my results, but actually it helps that I now am very clear on what my results are. Then I start at the beginning and then I do the end. But I mean, for different people, it's different things, but just you, you don't have to write in order and don't worry about what you think is formal or academic language, because actually generally speaking, there, there isn't such a thing. The key thing is telling a story that's easy for you to write, as easy as possible, and as easy as possible for your, your reader to understand. Okay, um, now, um, how am I going to make sure that I write? So, so as, as you've heard, and I'm very grateful for the plug for my latest book, How I Lost My Mother. Do you know what I had to do to get that book written? It took me 10 years to sit down to write that book. Eventually, I could see this because I didn't need it. I was already a, a professor, and so, but I wanted to write, to write this book. So I thought to myself, if I register for a second PhD, and I tell everybody, and I then fail my PhD, or I give up, or whatever it is, when I supervise so many PhD students, it's going to be too humiliating for me. So I registered for the PhD, I got many other good benefits out of it. But part of what I got was that it forced me to finish, because it was too embarrassing not to. So I made, I made that threat of, of, of public humiliation. If you are from the sciences, this won't be news to you, but many people in the humanity still value single author writing rather than working in a team. It is, I find it with my own work, it's much easier. I, I have another book, which is single author, which I'm working on at the moment. It gets constantly put aside for stuff that I'm writing with other people. Because the minute I feel that I am committed to another person, I'm more likely to do the writing. So get yourself into a team. It's better to be to, to be one of four authors of something that actually gets published than a hundred percent author of nothing. Be generous to 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 um, to other people. Publish with them, particularly with students and less experienced people. Um, and don't worry. People say, "Oh, my intellectual capital." Now there may be some of you. I'm sure it's a minority who have ideas and patents which are potentially marketable. That's not so with most academics. And academics worry about uh, intellectual property, don't worry about intellectual property. And in my experience, the people who are most precious about their intellectual property are people who don't have much intellectual property. Generally speaking, you've had a good idea, you'll get another one. And this is the fun thing and the wonderful thing is that how do we get ideas? We get ideas in conversation. So I have a particular colleague that I write with a lot. And I've often had an idea. I would never have finished um, that written, writing that article. But when I work with him, we work together. It's better because I'm not giving away my ideas. He's improving my ideas. And then we end up as co-authors on an article, which is much better than anything I could have written um, on, um, uh, on my own. Now, I know all of you, like me, are um, under a lot of pressure to publish. And it's true, you've got to do it for your career, or you've got to do it to get your PhD, or in South Africa, we have this thing called the subsidy, and you've got to do it for the subsidy. That'll work, that'll get you to write one or two articles, but you have to find a reason for, um, apart from that. Karina, you're trying to remind me that my time is nearly up. Okay, can I have five That's, minutes? Uh, five to Sorry? ten minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah five sure. To I ten minutes. Yeah. Five to, okay, five to ten minutes. Thank you. I'm, I, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, then, I'm, I'm, and then, I've got a, I've got a lovely few questions for you. So okay, please leave enough okay. time for us. Okay. Thank you. Um, kick me again after five minutes if it doesn't look like I'm wrapping up. Okay. Thank you. Okay. But um, you've got to find reasons to, 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 to publish, and you can see some of what, what people have said there. For me, the big one is. Um, there, there, there are two things. One, I don't know what I think until I write, so it really helps me think. And the most amazing thing, I mean, I published the, my first academic article in 19, 
it was 1982, I can't quite remember. But I know what I thought 30 years ago. I don't know what I thought last week. It's the most amazing thing, actually, to be able to track your own thoughts. Um, it's it's um, fantastic. Okay, I said we would come back to this issue of peer review, and I'm going to go through this quickly. The first thing is just Google peer review, and you will find lots and lots and lots of um, people's misery, if, uh, you know, lots of jokes about peer review and humiliation um, and how horrible reviewers are. But actually, who does the reviewing? It's people like you and me. Um, so let's just think about, we're now going to talk about if you're in that small group of people who, who get asked to, to revise and resubmit. Remember, if it's accepted, we're very happy. If it's rejected, until we start getting a pattern of rejections, to just um, send it somewhere else. Um, so what must we remember? And I'm sorry if I offend religious people, it's not my aim. It's peer review, people like you and me. It's not a comment on who you are. They don't know. Remember your last article you read? You don't know who the author is, so you don't know how clever they are. Everyone gets rejected. You're allowed to lick your wounds for a bit, but not forever. Share that humiliation. That's why it's nice to be writing together with other people. And remember that reviewers are trying to do their best. Who has the power? It's the reviewers who have the power. So you may have started off with something that you like, but uh, you know, with the model of the car, which is quite a, a famous one on the, on the um, internet, do what the reviewers want because they hold the power. You may not agree, but do, do what the um, reviewers want. And how do you eat an elephant bit by bit? You have to show your reviewers that you've responded to each and every comment. Remember, reviewing is generally done for nothing. I do my reviewing literally at my kitchen table at three o'clock in the morning. There's no point in fighting with reviewers, generally speaking. And we, we know that the reason they don't, that, that they misunderstand you is that they're idiots and can't see your genius. But what you have to think about is, what have I done to help them misunderstand me so much? And always try and understand what they say, however hurtful. So how do you respond to reviewers? Please be polite to reviewers. Your comments go back to reviewers. I've got somebody, I'm an editor. I ask them a favor. Um, please send, send the, um, the, the, please be polite, okay? Say thank you if reviewers have said nice thing and give compliments. Be clear, reviewers contradict each other. That's the nature of science. So some will say, I want more of this. I'm gonna give you an example in a minute. Some will say, I want less of this. If the reviewer is absolutely wrong, do not say, you know, you fool, you don't understand. Just say, oh, um, I can see what you're thinking, but I think such and such. But and then, and then off, and then say, but if the reviewer still wants to engage with me with this, I'd be happy to have a further discussion. And generally, reviews will just leave, um, leave it, leave it at that. Um, if you complain, journals are generally looking to to reject you. And you know, be nice to your editor. Be nice to the reviewers. And when you review. Um, be a nice reviewer next time. So what I do is, and what I recommend that you do, is you will get comments from reviewers and comments from the editor. The first thing you do is you break those up. Into, you make a table and I'll show you how to do it. Break them up into small, small pieces. So, I mean, not obviously with these colors, but here's an example. And on the left-hand side, you write down and break into bits, even if it's in the middle of a sentence, every single word the reviewers have said. This is an interesting paper on an important topic, comma, but it fails to, et cetera, et cetera. And you, and you, 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 you do that. So it's, it can be pages and pages. Simply putting that information into the table on the left-hand side is often very containing. And then you start responding to these and you're gonna send this table back with your revised version. Um, but and start where it's easy. So if they say you, you know, this reference was wrong, say I'm very sorry I fixed the reference and you fix it. But you go through and this is it. Thank you very much. But it fails to articulate. Thank you. This is what I've done. Um, I've shocked and this has happened to me <laughs> that the work of Swartz was not cited. I've also been told by reviewers that you obviously haven't heard of Leslie Swartz. Um, you know, we apologize and we agree this is what we've done. I would have liked to see, have seen more discussion of something and you say, thank you. The other reviewer says the opposite. We've gone with the other reviewer because. So that when you send your article back 
for a second round or a third round, they can see you've taken them seriously, you've listened to them, and you've responded to each and every comment. Now, in my experience as a, as a journal editor, and I haven't got time to, to talk about this in detail, I know I've only got um, a very few minutes. Most common reasons we reject plagiarism, you would be amazed. Obviously pasted from a thesis where there's just too much information, too much irrelevant detail, conclusions not flowing from the data. I always say to people, we all know that the earth is round, but if you asked 12 people about their views on climate change, the conclusion is not that the earth is round, even though it's true. So it's not a question whether the conclusion is true, but does it flow from your data? And data are often irrelevant to the conclusions. People will often claim to be doing very original work when in fact they don't know the field, or they'll send stuff to the wrong journal with the wrong um, audience. Now, some of you would have had this experience. Um, I, I, I get these sorts of things every day. Um, here's a lawyer who, who's made me a beneficiary in, in her will and I must contact them, or I'm going to, to, to get this money um, and so on. You know, uh, there, there are various words for this in Africa, Sakawa and, and, and so on. I am this person and that, we all know these. Well, unfortunately in publishing, there's exactly the same thing. This is yesterday, I got this, greetings from this journal and they want me to publish something marvelous. What I know about stomatology and craniofacial research is zero, but they're asking me to write something. Or what I got this morning, um, they want an excellent submission and, they, and they, they sweeten it. Listen, look, the review feedback in three days, the date of publication within 10 or 15 days. Now this is what's called predatory publishing, never ever get caught by this. It is better not to publish anywhere than to publish in these journals because they do not have any form of review. There's another one. And in fact, there's, there are lists um, and you'll, you'll, you'll get copies of this so you can look, look at Beale's list of these predatory publishers. But generally speaking, if people approach you um, from these journals, it's too good to be true. They'll, they'll also offer to publish your book and so on. Generally speaking, these are these are cheats. Um, so, what what are we want journal quality? And I don't have time now to talk about things like uh, impact factor and so on. But it's a it's a it's a very um, uh, contested thing, and it varies from journal to journal and discipline to discipline. I can I can talk about this. Um, often it's about you know. Uh, looking for the easy way out, the impact factor of a journal is not a measure of how good a journal is, um, but it's, all it is is a measure of how commonly articles in a journal, in a particular set of journals, is cited by other articles in that same database. But look and see databases which do have credibility are the Web of Science, Scopus, Yellow, and um, the, the, what's known as the Norwegian list, and in South Africa, the Department of Higher Education and Training. There are also, um, this I will send to you, there are um, uh, uh, lists um, that we keep in South Africa. Um, we, can, we can send this to you. And there's also a very useful, I haven't got time to show it to you now, a very useful way of um, jane.biosemantics.org. If you go on there, you'll be able to see ways that, um, that, that you can um, find journals which, which are probably appropriate to where you want to publish because it has algorithms that look to see whether the text that you're using is similar to those. And that, Corinna, is my last slide. How's that for being perfectly on time? So thanks everybody for your attention. I know it's so hard to, to listen to somebody over the, um, over the thing, but I'm dying to hear what your, what your questions are. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I am just going to, to look at some of the questions um, that I've okay. created. Thank you, everyone, for submitting. Um, I We've got really good questions for you. Um, but I think one of the ones I enjoyed was to say, uh, Sharon McAuliffe just said, I love the honesty and frankness of the presenter and great ideas and tips. <laughs> so um, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Your, your experiences, because I think, you know, you're an experienced publisher um, and you still go through through some of these. So, oh, yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, uh, it's not for nothing that I call it addiction to humiliation. So people have a <laughs> fantasy, you know, oh, you know, Leslie just sends things to journals. I get stuff rejected 
all the time, all the time. All the time. Yeah. And, and, and it'll continue. And I'm 117 years old, and it's not fair. But you know, so yeah, yeah. So um, I also just want to say, lastly, we've got Dr. Marina Yubar on on the oh, great. chat as well, who's our science communication researcher. Yes, hi, Marina. <laughs> At Crest at Stellenbosch, um, yes. and she just made a comment. She posted some interesting links, which we will share as well um, when we Good. distribute Thank your you, presentation and the recording. But Thank she just you. said, um, so much of what you talked about today is also relevant to public communication of science. And then exactly. she said, notice how Leslie inserts many stories into his talk. Um, and she actually suggested that we, we ask you to come and speak to us about using storytelling as a tool in academic and popular science writing. So. Maybe there's a little collaboration for you on the cards. When it, when well, Marina it comes and I've been thinking about collaborating. And in fact, yeah, it's not for nothing I did a PhD in English and, and write stories. So absolutely, yeah. I, I completely thank you. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, okay. So starting with our first question from Precious Moyo. So she asks, at what point of the thesis writing process does one publish? So she's asking, do you first work on the chapter and then publish the journal article, or, or what would you suggest? Okay, so, so, so Precious, this is something which is really very much in flux. I don't know where you are. I'm assuming you're a PhD student. I think you're at, you're at Stellenbosch, aren't you? Or, um, so there, there, there are different conventions. So historically, um, you know, feel free to, to put on your mic and answer. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but um, historically, the way that we thought about PhDs was you write your, like when I did my first PhD, you write your PhD and then um, once it's done, then you, then you publish from your PhD. In fact, when I, even when I did my first PhD, which was in you know, the 1980s, um, I'd already published some stuff and I converted them into chapters for the PhD. Um, increasingly, um, and there's a new book has just come into, into Stellenbosch Library about this yesterday. Increasingly, um, and depending on which discipline you're in, people are doing PhDs by, by publication. So what you what you do is that as part of your PhD, instead of having these chapters, you actually have things that you publish often together with your supervisor or with your research team. So it, it really it really differs. It depends what the conventions are in your institution. It um, it depends um, on your 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 supervisor. It depends on your discipline. So in health sciences, I'm speaking under correction, but in many universities, the dominant way that that PhDs are done now is by publication. Similar in our university, I think in agricultural sciences, in the social sciences and humanities, where I am, probably most PhDs are not done in that way. So it's it's different. There are there are pluses and minuses, um, and I don't want to go into too much detail um, uh, about that. Um, one of the huge pluses for those of you who um, are very busy in jobs trying to run complicated lives. One of the huge pluses of doing a PhD by publication is that you can, you can see it's, it's much easier to get chunks done, you know, oh, that article's done and that article's done. You still have to put it all together with a good kind of um, narrative. So it works a lot. A lot of my students are older people um, who have full-time jobs and it really helps. In many ways, it's also quite it's more difficult because although you're doing all of these different things, you've got to put that together and make it look like one thing. So there, there, isn't, a, there isn't just one answer to that, but uh, it's changing. And I encourage you to discuss that with your, with your faculty and with your students. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Then another one from Linda Klabeni. She graduated her master's thesis in 2018. Can she still write about her thesis now? Absolutely. It depends. I mean, the important thing for me as a, um, it's, it's hard to say because I don't, I don't know what your subject matter was. It's um, depending on what, what you have to show, if you think about when you're writing an article, your literature review must be absolutely up to date. So when you're writing in 2021, you have to have references from 2021. Now, if those references have taken the field past, I don't know what your field is, if they've taken your field, the field past 
where you were in 2018 and your work's now become irrelevant because there's now a new method or, or whatever, then I'm afraid that ship has sailed. But, but often that's not the case. And what is important, depending on your field, is that you historicize appropriately where you were. So you, you share with, this was collected in 2018. This is, and I'll tell you where it's, I'll, I'll give you an actual example. I had to, I had to consider a beautiful article um, on healthcare in a part of Cape Town. And the data were collected in the late 1990s, it was beautifully written. Um, the late 1990s, so it's a long time ago, this was like recently. But I mean, she was making beautiful points, but the author was writing as though the healthcare system in South Africa had not changed since the 1990s. I mean, we had a whole new act in primary healthcare and, you know, so they, they were actually referring to old apartheid, you know, so she hadn't adequately, the author, and I, I know it's a she eventually, because eventually it did get published. My response was a reviewer, because I could see there were still interesting things to say was, you have to historicize all of this. And you have to show your reader, why is it interesting for a reader in 2021, not in, because it's, it's, it's not 1998 anymore. Why is it interesting for a reader now, who's in the conversation now to learn about that? And in fact, she had things that were very useful to say. So it's not, it, it lies not in the data itself, but in the relationship to, to your argument and your data in terms of current conversations and discussions. Perfect. So Linda is in clinical communication, which I think just tags onto that very beautifully. Good. Yeah. So Leslie, I think your last slide dealt with um, journals. So Christine Rogers, yeah. um, she asked for comment on predatory publishers. Would that list be sufficient yeah. or a, yeah. a good start? Okay. Look, you know, it's never sufficient. So in fact, you know, Jeff yeah. Beale, who, who made Beale's list, he was kicked off for a while. He's back. Essentially, when you look at a journal, and I'm really glad you asked, asked this question, Christine. Look really carefully. Who's the editor? And then look, what has the editor published? I was just asking, I, I just looked for fun because I knew I'd get this question today. Who's the editor of stomatology? Who knew that stomatology had anything to do with teeth? But anyway, stomatology and craniofacial surgery, which I'm being asked to, to publish. And it's quite funny to think about um, how they got to me because although I, I do have teeth, I, I don't write about them. Um, and I can't work out, you know, I, I worked out one, I, I got a thing from a hydrology journal. And that was, I was writing a lot about access to water in South Africa, but I'm not a hydrologist. But um, anyway, and so I looked at who's the editor of this journal and it's somebody, I couldn't find a single article by them mm. on even on Google Scholar. So, you know, it's, so look carefully. And if you're still not sure, write to the, the, um, the author, the, because of course there are also, I meant to say, there are good journals that are not yet on the lists. So when I started, I was, I was founding editor in chief of African Journal of Disability. It takes time to get onto those lists. We're now on Scopus, we're now, but you know, people could look up and see like, who's the Swartz guy? I don't know. I mean, generally speaking, people think I'm a woman. So they think, who the hell is she? And um, it's helped me in my publishing career, but that's another story. Um, but they look up and they say, oh yeah, no, look, listen, this is someone who knows something about disability. So you know, do research, do research, please. And then just to add to that, the question from Tulani is, yeah. um, should you trust a journal that requires a publication fee before comments can be sent to the authors? Um, you know, that's, that's really interesting. Generally speaking, no. And I'll okay. tell you why. So it's okay to, like, there are good journals. So all the PLOS journals, um, all the Biomed Central journals, you know, they, they require publication fees because that's for open science. And I mean, mm -hmm. I like to publish in those journals because I want my work to be read in Africa. I'm very lucky mm -hmm. working now with South African Journal of Science. We have a government grant. So we open access, we don't mm -hmm. have to charge, but it's a bit like, you know, all the debates about fees at university. There's no such thing as free higher education. It's a question of who's gonna pay. Is the taxpayer gonna pay or are the students gonna pay? And with, with these journals, somebody's gotta pay and are the authors gonna pay from their research grants or are the libraries, you know, gonna pay? Okay. Um, there is no credible author of 
a journal which charges page fees, who is not going to move heaven and earth if they think that you've written good work to help you, particularly if you're from a low income country and South Africa is not low, we're a high middle income country, but, but who's not gonna move heaven and earth to try and find a way to get your thing published. They're not gonna ask for the money first. I have never, I mean, when I was editing African Journal of Disability, I mean, I shouldn't have, but I used my own research fund sometimes to pay the fees so that people from, uh, I think it was Uganda, they hadn't, didn't have any money, but they were right. You know, um, no credible academic will think this person can't pay. But those financial considerations, you know, the most important thing is academic considerations. So that may be a red flag. I don't know. I mean, maybe there are journals that ask for this first, but I would be really worried because, because of rejection rates. So most things that, why would you be paying money because your chances are 90%, are they going to give you the money back then? Your chances are 90%, they're not going to take it anyway. No, I mean, that's, that's if, you know, if, if something smells like a fish, it's probably a fish. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Prof. And then Takawera and Do Felipe asked, um, yeah. he asks, how can you improve a, a manuscript on the basis of this feedback? So in an inverted comment, although your paper has potential, the current version is mainly descriptive and its add on contribution to extant literature is unclear. Okay. As a result, it has been denied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. This goes all, and I hope you're here for the whole thing. That's not a bad comment. That's really not a bad comment. It's a helpful comment. It goes to everything that I've said any article in any discipline, whether it's physics, whether it's engineer, it doesn't matter. It's an argument. So um, you have to, to, to write from the beginning, what is, why are you doing this? What is your argument? What are you trying to show? And not just, I found this, I found that, I found that, isn't it interesting? Nobody, you know, so, I mean, we, we got, um, I, I just reviewed something actually, interestingly enough, not for my journal, but for an international journal on disability. And it was so nice. It was telling me about 21 um, sites in a, in a, in, in a country and, and, and what the rehabilitation services look like. And yeah. there's this many people and this long waiting time. And my response was so. Who cares? I'm sitting in Cape Town. I've never visited that country. I'll never visit that country. What does that mean for me? If they'd taken that information and said, look, you know, not much has been written about this in, in, in Africa. And when we actually analyze the waiting times, we find that there's a whole dimension in waiting times that women wait longer than men, or that or um, there seems to be a relationship between um, whether it's rural or urban or, you, you know, something that hasn't been looked at in the literature, then we're in business, then we have an argument, but actually telling me what the waiting times are in 28 uh, provinces in, uh, or facilities in a, in a country that I've never visited, too descriptive. I, I hope that helps. It's about constructing Thanks. an argument. Thanks. Yeah. Prof, we're starting to run to the end of our Q&A session. Um, yeah. And you've just been a common commended for your sense of humor as well. So I'm going to ask two questions together. First one from Dr. Buntu Kruwe on how to handle a situation where you have submitted an article to a journal and have signed copyright transfer, for, but after that you get no response from the journal. And then Pinal asks, can you withdraw an article from a journal if you feel that the editors are pushing their own agendas by wanting you to include information that you feel yeah. is truly not relevant? Yeah. Or yeah. of particular, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, can, let me start with the second one uh, first. You will get editors sometimes or reviewers. Um, and, you know, I, I have a classic example I can't go into, but say the article was all about how we grow oranges. And all the reviewer said was, but what about apples? And as it happens, you must cite, and as it happens, the 10 articles they wanted cited about apples all happened to have been written by the reviewer because the reviewer mm. was unethically trying to increase, and it happened to be a he in this case, trying to increase uh, citations for his work. That's unethical. You have the right at any time in the process. I mean, I would say don't waste journal's time but if if you if if you feel that this is happening you can withdraw at at any time I mean, you can't send to multiple journals simultaneously and don't mess journals around because people are doing this generally speaking for nothing but yes you can um 
if you've got if you've got your foot in the door of a journal, try and do what they say because it's so hard. <laughs> you know, so yeah, but but if, but if you feel that there's something weird going on here, yeah, don't. Um, the thing about signing copyright and then they didn't get back to you is worrying. It's never happened to me. I hope it's not a predatory journal. Um, I honestly don't know. You've 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 got to keep, but I think I think you've got to keep trying to contact them. Um, try and find a maybe a phone number and you can phone through WhatsApp, which which you you know because that 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 also might might help. But then you can also um, write to them and say eventually if you don't hear from them they haven't published, um, I'm going to withdraw. And then if you and then and then you say I'm withdrawing and I'm withdrawing the copyright. But if you have legal advisors in your university, just ask them about that. It's it's not something that I've had experience of. It's very it's very weird, and I'm sorry it's happened to you. That brings us to the end of our talk. I just quickly want to mention, um, Prof, for those delegates that would like to. Um, attend a longer session. Um, colleagues, we've got Prof. Leslie um, presenting a workshop on getting published and science dissemination. I've just posted the link in the chat. It will be on 26 through 28 July. So in two, three weeks time, we still have space. Um, you can email Amolsha on ADA School, the same email that you got this um, from, or you can contact us through the website. Um, yeah, so if you would like to, to ask more in-depth questions, we're definitely distributing this recording um, with permission from Prof. Swartz. We, he's given us permission to, to distribute the presentation if you want to, um, to look up any things more in-depth. Um, if we have supervisors on the presentation, we're also doing the PhD, supervising the PhD by publication at our winter school, so that might also be of interest to you. And then, Prof, we, um, we've had so many compliments, and I'll definitely send you the, the transcript. Um, people feel that I've learned so much, but there's been more than one request. Um, and I was thinking, do you ever look for reviewers for your journals? Always. So with that in mind, um, more than one person has asked if you would be willing to give us a workshop on reviewing, because one often gets thrown into the deep end and I some mentor uh, might be helpful. I would, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, good reviewing. I would, I would love to. One thing I just want to say about the workshop is um, some of what I started with and went through quite quickly today. Mm -hmm. I will repeat at the start of the workshop because yeah. not everybody. But you, you know, you can never hear my voice too too often. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I just want to warn people that that there will be a, some overlap, but there'll there'll be more opportunity to develop yeah. things and for you to do get a bit more yes. practice yeah. and so on. Yeah. Okay, so I'm um, not to put you on the spot or anything, but um, if anybody would like to turn on their videos and join me in appreciating Prof. Swart's time, um, it's, uh, it's been such a lovely chat. Um, I really, really appreciate all your time and your wealth of knowledge. Um, oh, there's Marina, our colleague from Stellenbosch. Um, oh, you can see there's many happy faces. Oh, Charlie, good to see you. It's nice to see you again. Um, but I hope that we have okay. the opportunity to interact with you again, to, to have such um, a wonderful resource. I feel like we should share you with the world. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, I guess we'll be in touch. Um, please email us, delegates, uh, colleagues, if you have any questions. Thank you for everything, Prof. Yeah, well, th thank you. Thank you all for your patience with my nonsense. I, I hope you learned something. Yeah. <laughs> It's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Have a good lunch and we'll we'll see everybody hopefully shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.